Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the word of God for our special consideration this morning is the eighth verse of Psalm 32. I will make you wise. I will instruct you in the way that you should go. I will guide you, keeping my eye on you. This is the word of the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there are promises and there are promises, right? As a dad, I've made lots and lots of promises to my kids and all of them were important in the sense that I gave my word to my children, but they weren't all earth shattering. The world wasn't gonna end if we didn't go out for ice cream. But two months ago, I knelt here in the front of our church and I made a series of promises that actually still scare me a little bit, even after almost 30 years of ministry. I promised to preach and teach according to God's word and the Lutheran confessions. I promised to live a life that reflects positively on my Savior. 29 years ago, I stood in the front of another church next to the young woman who was about to become my wife, and I promised to love her and be faithful to her for as long as we both shall live. Twice I've stood in the front of churches and led my sons and their brides in making those same promises to each other. Three times I've stood in the front of a church and heard my children promise to hear God's word and to be faithful in coming to church and to suffer death rather than fall away from the Christian faith. Those were all pretty big promises. In just a few minutes, Eight of our teachers are going to stand here in the front of our church and make some pretty big promises. But you know what? We're not going to ask them to promise this morning that they'll do their best teaching math or science or social studies or English. That promise is really going to be assumed from the other promises that they make. Instead, they will do what I did two months ago. They will promise that they will teach the gospel faithfully and live in a way that gives credit to the gospel. They will promise that they will serve the Lord. And in that Christian life comes that promise of being good teachers. That's part of being a good Christian. But the heart of the promise they will make is they will teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's true because their promise is the pledge of a Christian teacher. Saint, or King David, 3,000 years ago, made a promise. He wrote it at the end of Psalm 32, most of which we sang a few minutes ago. But the psalm begins a long way from the promise he made. It begins with these words, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Why did he start there? Well, because King David had committed very serious and real sins. He had seduced the wife of one of the officers in his army while that officer was away at the front fighting David's war. And when she got pregnant, he tried to hide his part in all of that. And when that failed, he arranged for his commanding general to murder that officer and make it look like a battlefield casualty. And then he moved that man's wife into his palace and married her and he pretended like that pregnancy was just a normal part of wedded bliss but deep down inside king david knew that he had sinned he wrote when i kept silent my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long for day and night your hand was heavy on me my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer unresolved guilt can cause enormous emotional distress. It can even cause our health to collapse. King David may have been suffering from clinical depression. And it went on for almost nine months until finally God sent a prophet to confront David and lead him to repentance. David confessed his sin and God forgave him. And Psalm 32 represents the spiritual healing and growth that David experienced as God led him back to his grace, as David learned again to trust that he was forgiven, even for these terrible sins and crimes he had just committed, even 
as he learned to trust again that all the rest of God's promises still applied to him. That's what led David to write the verse that we are focusing on today, verse 8, which will serve as the theme for our school year this year. Three times in that verse, King David made a promise. He made that promise to God, first of all, but he also made the promise to the people that God called him to serve. That's the you in that promise that we'll see in just a minute. The I is King David, but the you isn't God. The you here is the people David served. And that makes David a tremendous model for all pastors and teachers who are ever called to serve God's people. In just a few minutes, our teachers are going to echo those three promises that King David made, and for much the same reasons. Now, don't misunderstand me when I say that. None of our teachers have committed the kinds of sins that David committed. None of them has committed murder to cover up cheating on their spouse. But all of them are sinners and they know it. It's just a question of degree. Each one of them was born a sinner in a sinful world. Each one of them has experienced guilt and sadness over choices that they made. And each one of them knows their Savior. Each one of them rejoices in the forgiveness that Jesus won for them. Each one of them has learned to trust that God loves them, no matter how guilty they have been in the past. All of God's promises apply to them. God sent Jesus to die and pay for their sins. God sent Jesus to rise and give them eternal life. God sent the Holy Spirit to work in their hearts and give them faith. And that Holy Spirit has led them to make the promises that we will hear today. Those promises are a Christian teacher's pledge, which is always a fruit of faith in Jesus. But what is it specifically that they're going to pledge? Well, you could say it a lot of different ways. If we follow what King David said, they're going to begin by promising, I will make you wise. Now in the Bible, true wisdom is not the insights of a really smart person. It's not the advice you get from the self-help section of a bookstore or the street smarts that come from the hard knocks in life. In the Bible, true wisdom is always faith. At least three times, the Old Testament says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And as we learn in catechism class, the fear of the Lord doesn't mean that we're scared of God. It means rather that we revere God as our Lord and as our Savior. It's Old Testament language for faith. So faith is the beginning of wisdom. And the opposite is also true. Psalm 14 tells us that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And the Hebrew word that most English translations render as fool does not mean someone who's intellectually stupid. It does not mean someone who can't tie their shoes or who can't pass a test. It doesn't even mean someone who keeps making dumb decisions in their lives. The word means someone who does not have a moral compass. That's what comes from not trusting in the one true God. Making and keeping our children wise for salvation is the number one task that all our teachers do. That's why they became Christian teachers. So any one of them could have taught in the public school, and some of our teachers have. But today they are all here at St. Paul's because they want to share a kind of wisdom that the public schools just aren't interested in sharing. Faith in Jesus Christ. So every day, they will present Jesus. All our teachers will present Jesus to all the students in our school. And that does mean that they will lead our children to recognize their own sin. Because you cannot trust in the Savior unless you know that you need one. I spent nine years serving a congregation on the shore of Lake Michigan. Just south of our house, there was a Coast Guard station. And all summer long, their boats and their helicopters would race out onto the lake to help boaters and swimmers who were in trouble. Lake Michigan is particularly dangerous because it can develop an undertow. An undertow is a hidden current that suddenly grabs a swimmer and sweeps them away from the shore, sometimes a mile or more. Well, imagine if that happened to you. 
and the Coast Guard sent that speedboat racing out to you, and they throw a life ring into the water next to you, but you didn't think you were in trouble. Imagine if you told those Coast Guardsmen that you were okay, they could just go back, you'd be fine. Don't you think they'd argue with you? Don't you think they'd try to get you to look and see how far from shore you really were? But until you believed that you were in trouble, you would not grab that life ring. The teachers in our school want every child who attends St. Paul's to reach eternal life. But that means the children need to understand that they are in trouble. They need to understand that they're sinners. But our teachers, above all else, want to throw them the life ring. They want to assure every child here that Jesus is their Savior. He came to live and die and rise for all of us because the most we can ever accomplish on our own is to go to hell. So he came to rescue us and bring us home to heaven. That's the wisdom that these teachers will pledge to share in just a moment. King David went on and he said, I will instruct you in the way that you should go. The most common metaphor in all of scripture for living our lives down here is walking on a path. Again and again, God talks about us walking the path that he has laid out for us or following a different path that leads only to death and destruction. King David understood that we all need people sometimes to tell us how we should live, to tell us what God wants us to do. Many times in my ministry, people have come to me for advice. What should I do in this or that situation? Day by day, our teachers will guide the children in our school in understanding what it means for a Christian to put their faith into practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So that means that they will teach them the Ten Commandments and more. But they're not going to just read lists of laws to them. They're not going to try to beat them into submission. They will work to develop a relationship with those children. They will work to inspire them and gain their trust they will model Christian love and encourage a Christian attitude while they teach them what Christian behavior means. Lastly, King David said, I will guide you, keeping my eye on you. Is that supposed to sound scary? If you keep your eye on somebody, what does that mean? Well, it can be negative. I've sat at faculty meetings in other schools where the teachers agreed that they needed to keep their eye on a specific child or maybe a specific group of children because there seemed to be a problem among those kids. Sometimes when we keep our eye on something, we're saying that we're watching things that might cause trouble. But it doesn't have to be negative. When our kids go out to recess, there'll be teachers out there keeping an eye on them. They want to make sure they don't run out into the street or climb over the fence or slip on the ice. King David talked about guiding his people keeping his eye on them. He grew up tending sheep. He understood how important it was to watch over those sheep. He guided them to green pastures and living waters. But he had to make sure that the sheep followed him. The point is our teachers will promise to pay attention. They'll promise to be engaged in all that our children are doing while they guide them in Christian faith and life and in all the other things that our children will study while they're here. That's King David's version of the promise our teachers are about to make. So let me address our teachers directly here for just a moment. Does all that seem a little bit intimidating? It should. The promises that we make when we are installed into a new ministry are scary because they're big promises. And we don't just make them to the children in our classroom or to the parents that we serve or to the congregation that calls us. We make them to God, who always knows how well we keep them. He sees all the times that we fall short, all the times that we get a little bit lazy, all the times that we're just not up to the task. He sees all our sins and failures. And he sent Jesus to pay for them. Jesus was the one perfect Christian teacher who ever lived. And his life of careful and loving instruction applies to you. It counts for you. Every time you stand up in your classroom, God sees Jesus and he calls you perfect. 
And Jesus died and paid for all of our sins and failures in our classrooms and in our entire lives. Jesus died and paid for everything that we ever feel guilty about here at St. Paul's. Jesus died and paid, and there simply is nothing left for us to pay. Jesus rose to assure us that we are forgiven fully and completely. All our sin is gone forever. And that is what leads us to make the promise that you are about to make. It's not about how gifted you are. It's not about how good you are with the kids. It's not about how well trained you are. It's about the love that God has poured out on you, being reflected back to him and to the children and the families that you will serve. And so I call you today to make the Christian teacher's pledge, which is always a reflect, reflection of the love of Jesus. My friends, we're about to witness that pledge. But the Christian faith is never about what we do. It's never about our promises or our works or our efforts. The Christian faith is always about what God does. It's about Jesus. It's about what God has done through Jesus and what God promises to do through Jesus. And that's true in this pledge that we're about to hear too. Only God could make these teachers want to make that promise. Only God can give them the gifts and the strength and the tools to keep that promise. And my friends, God has done both. And this year we will see what God will do in the lives of the children in our school, in their families, in our congregation, and in our whole community as he works through all the teachers that he has called to serve here. And what an adventure it is going to be. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus.